Uh, today, we're beginning a brand new series, and I'm talking about a bountiful life. A bountiful life. What does that mean, to have a bountiful life? Well, according to Scripture, a bountiful life is a life that is blessed by God. Now, maybe you're like I am. You go out, and you hear a lot of people say, have a blessed day. Have, yeah, have a blessed day. I mean, we get that, right? And so, uh, what does it mean to have a blessed day? Well, most people are just being kind when they say that. They're being nice, and they're wanting you to have a day blessed by God, okay? So, we get that. But what is a, a bountiful life? Well, if you define this according to Scripture, it is not a life that is free from trouble. It is not a life that is free and easy, okay? A bountiful life doesn't mean a, a life with no problems. A bountiful life doesn't mean a life that, you know, everything goes according to the way you think it should, according to plan. That's not what a bountiful life is. A bountiful life is not free of problems. It's not always comfortable. It's not always easy. But a bountiful life is one that God promises to be with us. How many of you know that if God is with you, everything's okay? Okay? He promises to be with us. He promises to use us for His glory. He promises to guide us. That's a bountiful life. You read the book of Proverbs, and I call it insight for living, wisdom for living. Do you know how many people have no insight when it comes to living? No insight on making the right choices? They just fly by the seat of their pants. They fly blind. But God, to the believer, to the one that trusts in him, the one that lives this bountiful life, he promises to guide us. He promises to forgive us. Now, to the person that doesn't really take time to look in the mirror or to examine their life, they may think, oh, I don't need forgiveness. Well, first of all, that is a, that's maybe an arrogant position to take because who among us can say, honestly, well, I've never done wrong. I never need to be forgiven for anything. You know, I, I think about this. My grandmother, uh, she didn't get saved until she was 70 years old, okay? And, and my dad had started a church, and I, my dad had prayed for her for years. We had prayed for her for probably 30 years to be saved. But my grandmother was a moral person. She was a person that said, I don't need to be saved. Or she'd say, I get saved all the time, you know. And, uh, but I, I'll never forget, my dad told me that my grandmother, one day during the service, she walked from the back of the room to the very front of the room, and she turned and faced the congregation. Here's what she did. She raised her hand. She says, I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior, my Lord and Savior today. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Well, for years, she was like so many. She didn't think she needed forgiving. She didn't think she had ever done anything that needed forgiveness. But when she finally understood, she committed her life to Christ. So a, a bountiful life is a life that has been forgiven. It's a life that has been put in right standing with God. It is a life where we trust God to provide for us. It doesn't mean you're going to be rich, but it means that you don't worry like others do. Why? Because you trust God, who is your provider. It is a life where we follow Jesus. That's a bountiful life. So today, I want to talk to you about what does it mean and there are five aspects that I'm going to talk about over the next five Sundays about a bountiful life. And today we're going to talk about sowing. Sowing. What does that mean? Uh, we're, next week we're going to talk about plowing. You don't want to miss. I got some great stories I'm going to tell you. Uh, you don't want to miss next Sunday. Uh, then we're going to talk about growing. You can't have a harvest unless the crop grows. Then we're going to talk about waiting Man, that's something we need to hear in this culture today, isn't it? We want it, and we want it right now. It's like the guy that was praying for patience. He said, Lord, give me patience, but give it to me right now. <laughs> well, we need to learn that there is something about waiting that God does in us. And then we are going to talk about reaping. Well, today, 
we're going to talk about sowing. And I'm going to read two very short parables that Jesus, and remember, Jesus would often use these farming metaphors, okay? He would talk about sowing and reaping and planting and all this different stuff. And today I'm going to talk about, just read two short parables that were back to back. And Jesus compared the kingdom of God to these things. I'm going to define for you what the kingdom of God is. But let's begin reading in Mark chapter 4. If you have a Bible, you can turn there. If you want to follow along on your phone or you want to read it on the screen, that's fine. Uh, Mark chapter 4, verse number 26. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. Now keep in mind, this is very common. Everybody knew in Jesus' day about sowing seed. Why? It was more of an agrarian, rural society, all right? They understood it. He says, this guy plants seed on the ground, and he sleeps and rises night and day. Now, you read that, and we kind of almost miss almost a little bit of, I would say that Jesus was being a little bit humorous here, maybe even a little bit sarcastic. He goes about his normal day. He goes to bed, he gets up, he goes to work, he sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He doesn't know how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, and then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. And then he goes on to another uh, short parable about seed that we all have heard about the mustard seed. Here's what he said. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Remember, in both of these parables, he's talking about the kingdom of God. He says, how can we compare the kingdom of God? What parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed. That's interesting. It's like a grain of mustard seed. Now, I've heard this quoted many times and probably been misunderstood a lot. Okay, so he says, here's, read, read what Jesus said. This mustard seed which is sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Now, let me just let those of you that may be a bit critical um, in on this is just simply a figure of speech. Jesus was not suggesting that this was the tiniest seed in the universe. He knows better than that. But it's like you and I, we will say things like this. These are just figures of speech. Anybody ever said, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse? Anybody ever said that? Now let me just take a survey real quick. How many have actually eaten an entire horse for a meal before? Anybody? No, you know, yeah, some of the teenage boys could. They raise their hand in the back, right? But no, you know why you don't do that? That's just simply a figure of speech. You know what you're saying? I'm really hungry. And what Jesus was saying here, and everybody understood what he was saying. This was not a, a, a scientific statement. This was just an illustration. That's all it was. He said, this mustard seed, which is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. What does Jesus say about this in particular? That faith, even if it starts small, when it grows, it becomes powerful. Now, maybe your faith isn't all that it should be right now. And i got to be honest, there have been many times in my life that my faith was not as strong as maybe it should have been. I mean, anybody besides me ever worry about something? If you're really worried about things, it means you're probably not fully trusting God, right? I mean, you ever worry about finances? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. Anybody ever worry about how your kids are going to act or how they're going to turn out? You ever worry about the economy? You ever worry about the election? You ever worry about our country? You ever worry about... Anybody ever worry about anything? I know I have. And so the point is that Jesus said that when you have faith like... A grain. He didn't say the size of a grain of mustard seed. 
He said, but like a grain of mustard seed. In other words, it may start small, but if you let it grow, it's going to become really powerful. That's his point. And so let me define for you, if I could, exactly how we can understand what Jesus is talking about here. Because he said in both of these parables, the kingdom of heaven is like, or the kingdom of God is like. So the question then becomes, what is the kingdom of God? What does he mean? Well, the kingdom of God, simply put, is God's rule over everything. It is that God is in control. It is, if you will, God's plan. You do realize that God has a plan, right? He has a plan for the universe. He has a plan for your life. He has a plan for the future. God has a plan. What is his plan? Eventually, his plan is that uh, everything will be restored back to its original order and creation. In other words, there's not going to be any more sin. There's not going to be any more death. There's not going to be any more sickness. There's a, a future day that's coming. And in that kingdom of God, in that day, God's plan for you, for me, is that we are going to live forever with him. Isn't that good news? Okay, that's good news. Now, I believe that the kingdom of God involves the church. Why is that? Because God's kingdom, God's rule, God's reign involves the church. Uh, with the church, through the church, the gospel is spread. And it is because of the gospel that we can have the kingdom of God. Okay, God's kingdom where he rules and reigns over everything, where everything is brought to justice, where everything is made right again. God's kingdom is not going to happen apart from the church. And so if you want to really get real technical and boil it down what he's saying here is really uh, that when you live for my purpose, when you live for me, that's the kingdom of God. Should you live for him? Should you be saved? Yes, that's the kingdom of God. Should you go to church? Yes, that's the kingdom of God. I'm calling all of you that are watching online. You should come and uh, worship with us in person. I love the fact that you watch online but I hope you'll eventually come and join us in person. There's nothing like it. I love the fact that we've got the technology to be able to have you online, but I think that there's something special about being around God's people. That's part of the kingdom of God, okay? Should you serve God with your talent? Is that a part of the kingdom of God? Yes. If you've been given a talent to sing or to lead or to help, Whatever the talents that God, God has given you, use it for the kingdom of God. That's a part of it. Should you fellowship? Yeah, that's part of the kingdom of God. That's why we have small groups. You see, we don't have small groups because we're looking for somebody to make a really good nacho uh, dip, okay? That's not the point. Now, if you make nacho dip, that's great, okay? I love nacho dip, but let me tell you, that's not the purpose. The purpose is... The, the, the Greek word is koinonia, which means to come alongside of. You know what God wants for you in the church, just like he wants in your family? He wants you to come alongside of others. It's the idea of fellowship. It's the idea of support. You know what happens when you come alongside of? You can support a person that maybe is not walking so well. You can encourage a person that's maybe discouraged. You can help a person that needs to be helped. That's what happens. By the way, you don't do that from a distance. You do that from being real close. You see what I'm saying? So the kingdom of God, what is it? Well, I believe it's uh, the church is included, but Jesus one day is going to rule as king. That's the kingdom of God. Now, maybe you are, I'm interested always in elections and the coverage of elections, and I get angry at the side I'm not voting for, you know, I'll be like, oh, how can they do that or say that? Anybody else like that? Okay. Uh, and I don't tell you how I vote because that's none of your business. All right. So, uh, and, and the church is not about politics. Okay. But the point is this, I get really tired sometimes of the nonsense. Anybody else use that word nonsense? Sometimes it is just absolutely ridiculous. Some of the things they say about each other. Oh, my opponent uh, wants little babies to suffer, you know, 
like, where did you come up with that? All right? It's like, you know, what is, where, did you, where did you get that from? All right? And me, on the other hand, I want everybody to be a millionaire. All right? So, and, you know, just forgive me for my cynicism. I think most of them lie, okay? Uh, but I, there's a point that I'm making here, and it's this. One day, one day, it's going to be King Jesus. And we don't have to worry about who's in the White House and who we vote for because it is going to be perfect because Jesus is going to be. That's the kingdom of God. And by the way, it is that everyone is going to call him king. See, wait a minute. What about atheists that don't believe in God? Well, the Bible tells us that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, does that mean that they're all going to be saved? No. But it means that everybody, and I mean everybody, even atheists, even those that reject God, even the people that are anti-God, one day they're going to bow the knee. They're going to say, yes, you are king. You are Lord. But the point is this. That in the meantime, if you become a follower of Jesus, okay, there's some things you need to do. Now, we believe that salvation is free. It is only available because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It's not because I'm good. It's not because I go to church. It's not because I've given some money to church. That's not got anything to do with my salvation. My salvation is because I've put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, in Christ alone. All right, that's salvation. That's free. But the kingdom of God, there, there are so many places where Jesus says, you know what you need to do is count the cost. Because the point is, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this next week, the point is that when it comes time to understand where you are in this process of living a bountiful life, of sowing and harvesting and, and all of this stuff, there is a price. It's free to get in, but if you're going to enjoy it, it's going to cost you something. And so um, this is what we want to see, that the truth is that when we talk about living this blessed, bountiful life, what does it mean? Well, I see three things that I want you to see about this life that pleases God from these two stories that Jesus told. And it's really, normally I give you like sentences or principles or whatever, but I'm just giving you three words, okay? Three words. The first word is participation. I want you to notice everybody participates. In this story that Jesus told, everybody participates. He said, how so? Well, uh, this one guy was sowing and reaping a harvest, okay? And it was so understood that nobody even questioned this. The idea is that everybody sows something, okay? Now, does everybody sow the right seed? No. Do you remember the other parable that Jesus told about sowing seeds? Remember the seed, of, uh, the parable about the stony ground and the path, the roadside, and the good ground? And the point is this. Some, he said, seed falls on the wayside, by the roadside, and the enemy comes and snatches it away. Do you know that there are some people... They're sowing seed, but they're just not sowing the right seed. Everybody is going to stand before God. Everybody is going to give an account. Everybody, and this is a sobering thought, one day we will stand before him. Okay? Now, I want you to understand that the unsaved are sowing seeds and deeds that fall by the wayside and get stolen by the enemy. Now, once again, I want you to see that um, this idea here of what Jesus is telling us, it, it's very sobering, okay? Now, what, that, what does that mean? Well, if not everybody is receiving the word, not everybody is being saved, if not everybody is following this pattern of God's blessing on their life, what does that mean? It means not everybody gets saved. Now, there's this idea called universalism. You need to remember that word. Universalism is the idea that in the end, 
it doesn't matter because everybody's going to go to heaven. And you know what? From a human perspective, you feel like, well, that'd be good if that was true because I don't want anybody to suffer. But do you realize that if universalism were true, that God would not be God? You say, well, how so? How could God be holy and righteous and loving and just? If he knew that in the end it didn't matter, everybody was going to go to heaven and still send his son to suffer as he did. How cruel would that be? How how ungodly would that be? How unloving would that be? God would have wasted his time, his son's time, uh, everyone's time if that were true, if universalism were true. The idea that it doesn't matter if you get saved or not because eventually we're all going to go to heaven. Whoopee! And the problem is that just simply isn't true. Can't be true. From a logical standpoint, it's impossible for it to be true. Otherwise, God would not be a loving, just God, and therefore none of what we believe would be true anyway. And so you got to understand that not everyone is saved, not everyone gets saved, not everyone uh, does what God intends for them to do. Now, are there people that do get saved that don't sow the right seed? Yeah, I believe there are. And we see this all throughout Scripture with people that were followers but didn't always live the way they should. And we see it also that in the stories that Jesus told. Jesus told in the parable of the sower and the seed, he told about some people that don't bear any fruit. Then he talked about people that some bear 30-fold, some bear 60-fold, some bear 100-fold. Maybe that's talent, but I tend to think it's faithfulness. Okay, And the point is this. Some people, even though they're followers, they're not sowing the right seed. Uh, There are some people that, even though they're followers, they're not 100%. They're what I call toe dipper Christians. Anybody ever do that? Like the first time you go swimming. Now, I got to be honest, I used to love to go swimming, I used to love swimming pools, especially love like swimming holes and rivers or lakes or whatever. I don't do that anymore. All right? You say, why not? Because I am old enough and smart enough to know that if I get into a public pool, some kid has peed in that pool, and I am not getting in that water. You say, oh, it's got all this chlorine in it. I still ain't getting that in my mouth is all I'm saying, all right? And and so, uh, but you know what a toe dipper is? You remember that? I I remember. I grew up in North Carolina, right in the mountains, and uh, so often when we would get ready to go swimming for the first time, it'd be cold. And you ever, you ever find out that when you get around that pool that there's some people that are going to be like, and they dip their toe in just barely. And you know what those people are? They are miserable the whole time because they get their toe in and then they get their foot in and then they get up to their knees and then they get up to their waist and then they finally get all in. That's never the way I got in. The way, the only way that I got in was number one, doing a cannonball, all right? And particularly if my mom or my sister or some other female was close to the edge of the pool, I would get running and splash them and get them wet. That was my goal, all right? So I think there are toe dippers when it comes to Christian living. They get their foot in. They like the idea of Christianity. They like the idea of living a bountiful life. It's just that they're not all in yet. Now that's the question. Are you all in? Or are you a toe dipper? Well, the good news is this. God loves you no matter what, and you can get all in. And by the way, um, I've seen it happen both ways. For people that they get saved, and then all of a sudden they're like cannonballing into the deep end, and they're all in. And man, From day one, they're just like, oh my goodness, great transformation in that person's life. Then I've seen, on the other hand, people that get saved, and they are a toe dipper to begin with. They're they're getting in, they're ankle deep, and then they're like, ooh, this feels pretty good. And then they get knee deep, and they're like, well, I'm not dead yet, all right? 
and uh, they're like, well, maybe this is not going to kill me after all. And then they get way steep. Ooh, so cold. And then before you know it, they're swimming in the deep end. And that's okay. And so here's the point that I want you to see, that God says everybody's participating in some way, okay? Because you notice in this story, the beginning and the end of the story, the man sowed and he reaped. He sowed and he got the harvest. We're all doing that. We're all sowing something. We're all reaping something. Now, speaking of that, let me give you the laws of sowing and reaping. They are, you reap what you sow, after you sow, and more than you sow. These are universal laws. They're spiritual laws, but they're also natural laws. Now, I grew up working on, my, both sides of my family were farmers. My grandpa Miller was a tobacco farmer. My grandpa Phillips was a tobacco farmer. Their great-grandparents, going all the way back, they were tobacco farmers. And that was not the only thing they grew. We had animals as well, cows and chickens and pigs and horses and dogs and cats and everything you could think of. Um, we also uh, would grow a garden. And then every year, uh, my dad would make sure that our family grew a garden. And I don't know about you, but I love fresh garden food. Do you like corn? I love corn. I, I love fresh corn that you grow and you, you know, you shuck it and you grill it. That's the best way to eat it. Grill it on a grill. It is so good. And I can remember what that was like. What if after, say one afternoon, we sowed corn? And, you know, to sow corn, you got to plow, you got to make the rows, you, you, you make the ridges in the row, and you put the corn in every so far, and then it grows. It takes time. And eventually, that single grain of corn produces a stalk that will have probably three years, sometimes more, uh, and each of those ears has hundreds of grains of corn. Now, what if we planted corn on a Friday, and I went out to look at that corn on the next day on Saturday. And, and, and I came running in to my parents. I'm like, you won't believe what just happened. I got some watermelon out of that corn that we planted. You're like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why? Because that's not the way it works. You, you reap what you sow, after you sow, and more than you sow. And the spiritual law is important as well. You, you want love? What are you sowing? You want kindness? What are you sowing? And by the way, we're all guilty of this, especially in the traffic around here, okay? We want people to be kind to us. And like, let me de demonstrate it because I know, I've seen some of you and I've even seen myself. Like, you know, it, it, the traffic's bumper to bumper and you're just like, hurrying to get home or hurrying to get to work, and some poor little old 184-year-old lady is driving her car, and you pull up within two centimeters of the bumper in front of you rather than letting that little old lady come in in front of you, even though she's been sitting there an hour, all right? And yet, if you were on the side of the road, you know what you'd want to do? you want somebody to let you in, Right? Let, 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 me, let me remind you about this law. You reap what you sow. You want love? Sow love. You want kindness? Sow some kindness. Uh, whatever it is, we reap what we sow. We reap after we sow. We reap more than we sow. Um, now, let me go on to the second thought. And the second word is patience. Patience. So we participate. God calls us to participate. The second word is patience. Now, what do I mean by this? Let's read again what he said. He sleeps and rises night and day. In other words, he's going about his regular life. And the seed sprouts and grows, and he knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, and then the full grain in the ear. I think the point is that the kingdom of God requires patience. It requires patience. Just in the same way that growing corn requires patience or growing wheat requires patience, 
The kingdom of God requires patience. And one of the things I've discovered in dealing with people that have been a believer for a while, I got saved when I was eight years old. I'll be 60 years old this month. So I've been saved over 50 years. And you know what I've discovered? The longer we're a Christian, the longer we go to church, often the less patience we have with those that are not saved or those that are just saved. You ever notice that? Well, I can't believe that they would want to have that kind of music in the church. Not remembering that it wasn't that long ago that there were things that God used to draw you to himself. Okay? Or I can't believe that she would dress that way and come to church. I've heard that. I grew up in a church like that. And it's like, you know, if you want to be going to heaven when you die, lady, you better wear you a dress. You know, it's like, where did you get that from? You know? Um, and, and, you know, it's like, you know, if it was good enough for the Apostle Paul, use the King James Version, it's good enough for me. All right? I know a lot of you don't laugh at that because you don't understand that the King James Version wasn't actually, it's a translation. It's not actually written when the Apostle Paul was on the earth. So that's why I think it's really, really funny. Obviously you didn't, but nevertheless, I do. The point is this, patience. Patience. And when he's talking about this, I think that growth requires patience, but it's also important that we note that when it comes to dealing with other believers... We must be patient with them. In fact, I would tell you, and I believe that I've got scriptural support for this, the people that think they're spiritually mature, the people that think that they're so, they're in spiritual graduate school, okay? And yet, they have no patience with the ones that are in spiritual kindergarten maybe, that are just saved, that are just coming along, that, and, and they're so upset and angry and so adamant about things, and there are some important things, don't get me wrong. I really think that the people that think they're in spiritual graduate school that do that are really in spiritual kindergarten. Okay? And so the point is that growth requires patience. you got to decide who you are. You can grow a weed in a couple days. You want to grow an oak tree? It's going to take you a while. Listen to what David wrote in Psalm 1. He said, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He's chewing on it. He's thinking about it. He's not treating it like Instagram. He's not treating it like TikTok. In other words, you know, it's there and then it's gone. He's thinking about it. He reads it. He lets it get into his soul. And he sh- when the person that does that, what's going to happen to that person? He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. Guess what? You got a season. Don't you wish that all the seasons were wonderful? I always love summer. I, I don't know about you, but you know, some of you are like, it's too hot. No, I love summer. The idea that I don't have to put on shoes but flip-flops to go feed my dogs in the morning is wonderful, okay? I don't want to get a coat on. I don't want to get long sleeves on. I don't want to get long pants on. I like the summer, okay? Now, some of you like the fall. I like the fall, okay? Uh, It's beautiful, and it's a little cooler, but I got allergies, and it kind of bothers me a little bit. Um, I like the spring, okay, but I really have allergies in the spring, And the winter, there's a reason I live in the South, okay? There's a reason, all right? I don't want to live where it snows. Uh, People are like, oh, they're calling for snow. Aren't you so excited? No, I'm not excited. If I wanted to have snow, I'd live in Buffalo, New York, all right? I don't live in Buffalo, New York. I live in Georgia, and I don't want it to snow, is all I'm saying. In fact... If I could live in South Florida and still pastor this church and just go back and forth, that's what I'd do because I don't like winter. Okay? But read what God said. You're going to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water 
and you're going to bring forth your fruit in your season. Okay? You're going to be faithful. You're going to be productive. But you got to follow what God says. And, and I'm out of time, but let me give you the last word. We talked about participation and patience. And the last word is the word process. You can tell I'm a preacher. I like starting all the points of the same letter, okay? <laughs> process. Notice the process, and we're done. He sleeps, and he rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He does not know how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, and then the ear, and then the full grain in the ear. Now, Jesus was not saying that there's nothing to do between sowing and harvesting. Any farmer would have said, nope, 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 that's not right. There's a lot of stuff. You got to plow, you got to fertilize, you got to get rid of the weeds. I and mean, there's a lot of work to do between sowing and harvesting. So, what was Jesus' point? I think that he, what he pointed out in this parable was that there are things that only God can do. Guess what I can't do? I can't grow things. I can plant. I can harvest. I can't grow. I can make the conditions right for growing, but I don't grow anything. Why? That's God's job and God's job alone. Does that mean that I don't have anything to do? No. Does that mean I don't try to create the right soil or I don't fertilize? No, that's not what it means. As a believer, I've got to work to make sure that uh, the conditions are good. But the point is that, and I really believe this is the point, a lot of people miss depending on God for what only God can do. I'm guilty of that. God, I want you to do this. You can do it right now. Anybody ever do that? Or, you ever have a burden, and the Bible says, cast all your burdens on him, for he cares for you. And we're like, all right, God, this is what I'm going to do. I got this heavy burden. And you bring it and put it at the feet of Jesus, and you're walking away. God, there, there it is, Lord. You take it. It's yours now. It, it's still there, God. I don't know if you heard me. Hey, here it is, God. You go ahead. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> If you're not going to do anything about it, I might as well pick it back up. And we walk away with it again. And don't miss what I'm saying. But for many of us, we forget that spiritual growth, that what God is doing in the life of believers... What God does in the life, do we have jobs to do? Yes. Do we need to do our part? Yes. But understand this, it is a supernatural act of God, and only God can do it. So when it comes to our part, what should we do? We should be faithful. We should pray. We should be interested. We should do what we can do. But ultimately, when it comes to reaping a harvest, well, you know, you're not going to reap anything if you don't sow. But ultimately, God is the one and God alone that can give the harvest. So what is the supernatural that you're needing in your life? Stuff that only God can do. Maybe it's you're praying for your children. And maybe, maybe they're not living the way you think they should live. And sometimes that's just on us has nothing to do with right or wrong. It has to do with we just don't like the decisions they're making. And I get that. Or maybe it's your marriage and you're like, I don't know if this thing's going to work out. Or maybe it's your job or maybe it's your finances. Listen, listen. God alone has the power to make things grow. I can plant, I can water, I can even harvest, but only God can make it grow. And so my encouragement to you is this. In these areas of your life, maybe you're frustrated, maybe you don't understand what's going on, or maybe you're, like the guy said, that you know I'm at the end of my rope and my fingers are slipping, okay? Can I encourage you, tie a knot, hang on, because God's not finished yet. 
God hasn't forgotten about you. Call on God to do what only God can do. And if you will, if you believe, there'll be a harvest. Amen? Amen. Lord, we thank you for this. We bless your name. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives and in our church. And we want you to know that we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you would like to have prayer before you leave, we'll have somebody up here at the front at our uh, prayer team. And uh, if you'd like to receive Christ today, you'd like to pray about what that means, church membership, you want to ask about a small group, you want to ask about serving, whatever it is, you come and there'll be somebody here to help you with that and to pray with you. Uh, But at this time, drop your next step card. Maybe you filled one out. Maybe you have a prayer request. Put it on there. Drop it in the bucket. And would you guys come at this time and let's give um, in the offering. Once again, there are four ways to give. Uh, You can give by putting in the bucket as it passes, or you can give by texting the number 84321. Or you can go to uh, stillwaters.online, um, or you can give on the Church Center app, okay? And if you don't know how to get that, there's a little teal card uh, on the wall as you walk out on your right, and you can grab one of those, and I'll show you how to download that. It's very good and convenient. That's why Kim and I give, and it's just really, really very helpful, okay? So this is an encouragement for you on this. I want to see all of our deacons that are here today um, in the room in the back on the way out uh, as, as we leave. Uh, just got something to talk to you about very briefly. It won't take long because, trust me, I'm ready to have lunch as well as you are. All right, so let's everyone stand. Uh, don't miss next week. I'm going to talk about plowing. I got some great stories that I'm going to tell you that, uh, along with this that I hope will be a blessing to you, Okay. Well, thank you for coming today. I love you. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday.